All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for our first Drupal NYC meetup of the new year, 2021. Woo! And, and new decade. And new decade, yes. Uh, depending on how you're counting, but yes, yes. <laughs> um, so a little housekeeping. Um, I see lots of lots of wonderful faces right now. Um, uh, no pressure, but uh, we'd love to, to see your face if you're you know, willing to uh, participate, try to make it a little more like we're seeing each other in person. <clears throat> um, please do mute yourself if you're not speaking. And uh, we're going to try not to use Zoom's text chat um, in favor of, of the Drupal NYC Slack. Uh, and that's because it doesn't last beyond the meetup. So if you post anything useful there, for example, it'll just disappear into the ether uh, once the meetup is done. Um, if you're not a member of Drupal NYC Slack, it's really easy to join. Uh, you just go to drupalnyc.org slash Slack. And we hope to see you on there. Um, so we've got three talks today. Um, so coming soon, we're going to hear uh, from Garrison Mejia about Drupal fast development with Lightning, uh, followed by Scott Wolpow uh, about OpenCart, uh, which is a non-Drupal uh, e-commerce uh, solution on uh, built with PHP. And then we're going to hear from Peter Wolanin about uh, Drupal security, uh, entitled Cracking Drupal. Uh, so today's meetup uh, was organized by these fine people, <clears throat> uh, always based on uh, the work of past organizers and the Drupal NYC board. Uh, and we'd love your help. Uh, so if you are in any way interested in helping organize the meetups, there are lots of different things you could be doing. Uh, get in touch. Um, the best place is on Drupal NYC Slack in the meetup-organize channel, uh, or you can reach out to any organizer. Um, <clears throat> so please do connect on Drupal NYC on Twitter. Uh, and of course, Drupal NYC Slack. And uh, we always ask that everyone consider supporting the Drupal Association. Oops, somebody says they think my Chrome sharing is paused. Yeah, I, it's not forwarding. The slides are not forwarding. Uh oh. Let me see what's going on here. So, have you seen nothing but the front slide? Correct. Ooh, weird. All right. I was using presenter view here, but that's not working very well. <laughs> what is going on today? Slack. Did it just change? Yes, it did. It says housekeeping. Okay. I think that there's a weird thing going on with with uh, screen sharing on, on Zoom now. It, it seems that I need to be kind of actively looking at the window uh, for it to update or something. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna change things up. Sorry, everyone. All right, we'll see how we do here. <laughs> Okay, so we ask that everyone um, consider supporting the Drupal Association. They uh, provide a lot of support uh, for the Drupal open source project and the infrastructure that uh, helps develop it, uh, as well as <clears throat> uh, organizing conferences and uh, rallying the troops uh, around the globe. Um, so please consider joining. Uh, it doesn't cost much at all. Uh, okay, some upcoming events uh, in the, the rest of the Drupal world. Um, so Drupal Global Contribution Weekend <clears throat> is coming up at the end of January. Uh, they're doing a 96 hour uh, kind of continuous event worldwide, um, which is pretty cool, cool concept. I don't know if that's been done before. Um, and they are inviting anybody who wants to, to host a sprint during that time. You choose when it is and uh, you know what the focus is on. Um, and Drupal NYC will support you and provide resources and promote it um, if that's something that you want to do. So uh, just get in touch. Um, does anybody else have anything to say about the Drupal contribution weekend? I don't know very much. <laughs> All right. Um, and then uh, Florida Drupal Camp is the next uh, Drupal Camp uh, coming up, and that's February 18 through 20. Uh, and the call for proposals is now open, um, so you can propose a session. And uh, Amy June, do you have anything you want to say? 
Sure. Um, I just updated the website. So all the trainings are up to date and there's some new ones. Some, some trainers that uh, trained at New York City Camp are having new um, trainings for Florida and it's only $10. Um, what else? I think that's it really. It is virtual. So it's going to be online. We're going to use Hopin. So um, Thursday the 18th is training day. Friday is sessions and Saturday will be contrib day. And Saturday for this contrib day, we're going to work a little bit differently. We're going to have a series of first time contributor workshops versus just one where we're going to segment segment different ways to give back. So if you're like into marketing, we'll have a specific little mini workshop for marketing and documentation, things like that. So you don't have to go through a whole code contribution workshop to find out how to contribute back to documentation. So that's what that'll be fun. Nice. Thank you, JD. Thank you, Amy June. And two more virtual events coming up. Um, there's mid camp. Uh, which is usually in Chicago, uh, and that's going to be online March 24 to 27, and DrupalCon North America, April 12 to 16. Uh, and I don't know if anybody has anything special to uh, say about DrupalCon North America. I haven't <laughs> done my research yet, uh, or if anybody has any other uh, upcoming events they want to announce. Well, for DrupalCon, the call for content is open, and it's a little bit different than it has been in the past. And I mentioned it because it's only open, I think, until February 12th or something like that. So we don't have a whole lot of time to get uh, submissions in. So if anyone's thinking about uh, contributing, you know, a presentation for DrupalCon, now is the time to kind of look and see what they're wanting this year. Fantastic. Anybody else have any other uh, Drupal events they want to promote? Going once, going twice. Sold. Oh, I should do my usual pitch though. At the bottom here, there's a, a URL, uh, drupal.org slash community slash events. If you haven't visited it yet, um, that's the best place to find Drupal events now. Uh, and there's an API. So if you want to do something fancy and uh, you know pull those down and do something with the, the data, you can do that now, which is pretty cool. Um, I know DrupalCal is, DrupalCal, <laughs> I don't know how to say it, uh, is uh, re, re engineering their, um, their website. Maybe they already have. Uh, to pull down that information. So you can also go to DrupalCal. Okay, so uh, some of you were probably uh, at Drupal Camp NYC 2020, and uh, the organizing team is uh, just gearing up to have their first meeting. Um, and so we're uh, seeking new organizers. Um, you know, anybody who's interested in participating, it doesn't have to be a, a large time commitment. Um, there's so much that goes into planning a conference. Um, so if you're interested at all, um, we encourage you to join the Camp Organize channel on Drupal NYC Slack, uh, or you can email camp-volunteer at drupalnyc.org uh, for more information. And do it soon because uh, we want to plan, uh, schedule our next meeting based on when the interested volunteers are available. Okay, so if you're interested in speaking at one of our meetups, uh, you can talk about pretty much anything as long as it's uh, of general interest to folks who are interested in Drupal. Um, it can be any length uh, and, you know, a wide variety of uh, difficulty levels or, or understanding levels for folks. Um, so please uh, contact an organizer or email speak at DrupalNYC.org and we will get you scheduled. So this is my, my latest uh, favorite photo of my daughter Ramona here. Um, and uh, we, 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 for years, we've had, uh, we've had the MC's, MC's kid on here, if, if available, uh, to see uh, who is hiring and who is looking. Um, so if anybody out there uh, is currently hiring for a position, or maybe their company is, um, or if you are out there and you are looking for work, uh, now is a good opportunity to, uh, to let everybody know here. Anybody, uh, Amy June? Um, I help with bad camp and I just updated the bad camp job board. So there's quite a few positions open, like from companies all over. Um, and then I work with canopy studios. We're a remote, uh, borderless company who hire people in North America and we're hiring for Drupal tech leads, Drupal, 
uh, developers, project management. So if you go to the Canopy Careers page, there's all kinds of different jobs available for Canopy. But I really encourage people to look at that Bad Camp job board because it's only going to be open for another two weeks too, and then we're going to pull it down for the year and start again. But um, there's a lot of great opportunities and good companies on there. Thanks, Amy June. Anybody else uh, hiring or looking to be hired? Going once, going twice. Okay, so there uh, are uh, not too many of us today. Um, so I think we can go around the go around the horn here and anybody who uh, is willing can introduce themselves. Maybe just uh, tell us your name and uh, where you're located. And um, uh, let's see what else. Your, your most favoritist Drupal thing that you have recently learned or, or are trying to learn. How about that? <laughs> uh, so I'll start, I'm JD and uh, I'm based in Jersey City, New Jersey. And uh, I have recently been uh, doing my first large Drupal migration from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, uh, which has been a lot of fun to, to figure out and uh, toy around with. Uh, I'm just gonna let folks jump in here haphazardly. Okay, well, I'm Scott Wopo. <clears throat> I'm in a store in New York and I've um, been actually been looking for a something I tried to build a number of years ago, but I think I found a couple modules to find out which Drupal modules are not being used on your site, even though you have them enabled, but you haven't really used them because that's a useful thing to get rid of because every time you get rid of a module that you're not using, it's one less place for them to get into your site to hack. So this thing called useless modules, which may be the one I, I want to use, but I got to find one that, that works well. And on to the next person. Hi, this is Holing. I am based in Brooklyn, New York. I work for the New York Public Library. And one cool thing I learned today is that we are between upgrades. So we have Drupal 7 installations and Drupal 8 installations ready for Drupal 9. Um, so uh, reverse proxy does wonders. <laughs> and and Brazilian 404 screens are my best friends. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Jed. I, uh, I'm, I'm usually in Manhattan, but uh, right now I'm in North Carolina, finishing out my holiday uh, trip down here. I've uh, worked on Drupal for a number of years and currently work in the healthcare industry. And the most recent thing I could talk about is after using Drupal VM for years, I am finally moving to Lando this month based on a presentation I saw here at Drupal NYC. Hi, uh, I'm Neil Trump. I work for the Drupal Association. Uh, I moved out of Brooklyn. I'm a bit upstate now and troubleshooting my internet, which is not, so I might drop off uh, for a minute. Everyone, I'm Peter Willen and uh, I live in Philadelphia now. Um, uh, Scott stole part of my presentation, which I'll be giving later um, <laughs> by telling you to disable and remove modules you're not using. Um, uh, favorite Drupal thing? Um, I don't know. I I like I like the magic of uh, form classes in Drupal eight and nine. It makes it nice to have a, a route in a form. Uh, Bob Phelps, uh, my, my most recent Drupal experience was in fact the last Drupal NYC camp, which I enjoyed very much. Really wished I had sprung and paid some more money so I could have uh, 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 seen more, done more, and, 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 and played, a, uh, you know, played around a bit with that really fun uh, kind of trivia, uh, uh, not trivia, but that, that rather fun game where people uh, were relaxing with strange hats and the like. Um, Apropos Drupal, for those who were here earlier, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a total novice and I, I, I'm about to try and start up again a, 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 a small Drupal site just for fun, um, just to see if I can do it. And uh, that will involve me getting the thing up somehow or another on AWS and, uh, you know, and, and through Bitnami, uh, you know, creating a local host environment and playing a bit with that. 
And so I'll be around from time to time at these meetings asking how to do I do I do that questions, which of course is fun. And I'm, I'm spread so thin, it's unbelievable. It, it, it's amazing. And so it's, I'm unlikely to be able to help that much, at least in the intermediate future. But, you know, things change rapidly in this world, I've noticed. And so that, that could change. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Anybody else want to introduce themselves? Sure. Um, I'm Dave Kopachek. Um, I am an independent Drupal developer and I am in the Catskills in Delhi, New York. And um, basically, uh, I, I don't have any uh, wonderful Drupal thing to drop right now, but I'm, I'm sure I can come up with something later if anyone can. So. Then I'll go next. Uh, I, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Ralph from Nuremberg, Germany, and lately I'm trying to uh, tame config split and config role split. Um, here, uh, I'm Gerson, Gerson Mejia. I was based in Brooklyn. I am currently in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, been working with Drupal for about four years so far, working on the couple and couple solutions, doing back end, front end, both sides. And yeah, happy to join. Fantastic. Okay, last call. Introductions. Um, I'm Julianne Catalano. I work at UMass Amherst. Um, I attended the Drupal camp. It's great that you guys are having this. I was at your last uh, meetup. Um, I am really, you know, beaming at this point on Drupal 8 and actually using Flex and CSS Grid, which is cool. And um, so, um, and, and one of the things I really like, uh, and I need to kind of get up to speed on the Drupal 8 end is for the form API, because I do a lot of those hooks um, in Drupal 7. Um, and uh, I recently had a project where um, that integrates with DocuSign, nothing big, but it just pulls in the, the shibboleth, um, the data that from the LDAP database. So it pulls it in and just pushes it into the DocuSign template, which is kind of nice. So I'm um, looking forward to um, learning more about Drupal 8, but those are my kind of things that I'm doing right now. Nice, thank you. Uh, any, any, anyone else want to introduce themselves before we uh, move on to our first presentation? Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, then I will welcome uh, Gerson Mejia up to the, uh, the stage here. <laughs> I'll stop presenting. And uh, Gerson's going to talk about uh, Drupal fast development with Lightning. And should be. <clears throat> okay, so let me share my screen. Uh, you guys, can, can you see my screen? Let me know. Looking yes, good. I can. Yep, we can. Oh, well, give me one second. I need my notes here. <clears throat> okay, thanks for joining. Um, this is faster Drupal development with Aqua Lady. Let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Gerson Mejia. So as I mentioned, I was based in, in Brooklyn. Um, because this is, you know, pandemic circumstances. Now I'm in Austin, Texas. Uh, yeah, but uh, as I was telling, mentioning, I've been working with, uh, well, I've been wor working on the development, web development and app development uh, space for about 10 years and working with Drupal for about four, four years so far now, um, working in different types of applications uh, or solutions, you know, like uh, the couple and couple. Uh, but this time I wanna, I know a few things, you know, about uh, Drupal lighting um, that I wanna share. So let's uh, dig in. 
So first of all, uh, for the ones that are not familiar, um, what is Drupal or Aquilate? So basically, um, this is an open source um, Drupal distribution that address capabilities that are not yet present um, in the Drupal core. Um, the idea with this is to help us rapid, rapidly create sites and applications. Um, this is basically, you know, the definition of, of Aquilighting. And so, but um, why lighting? Um, why, why was the idea of, of having, you know, or making lighting? So I gotta say that I am, uh, I don't work for Acquia. So just, just clarifying. Um, but, you know, I've been using lighting. That's why I am you know, sharing, you know, the ideas about lighting. Uh, and this is the thing, you know, the, the big deal about Drupal is that it shouldn't be a big deal. Those are words from Drys, you know, Drupal uh, founder, Drupal creator or co-founder. So I don't know how many of you have experienced, you know, like big deals or, um, sorry, uh, you know, like scratching off or, or trying to figure it out how, what's, what's Drupal, what to use. And, you know, nowadays building sites and applications requires, you know, greater levels of speed. Organizations are rushing to operate better, better in service of the customers. Developers uh, must be able to build, launch, and iterate rapidly. Uh, like great, you know, content rich experiences across every channel are required. The marketing and content teams must be empowered to create and manage contents. Those are, you know, of the things that you're gonna see when creating a site uh, and that everybody's like asking, you know, oh, okay, let's use Drupal, but let's make it fast. So Drupal is great, but you know, where do you start? You know, where, where do you start when um, you have now more than 2,100, you know, contributed projects or models? Uh, when there is need about 6,000 projects under development, um, the research options, the download and install, the configure modules, the write test if you are a pro. So selecting all, you know, the right, you know, group of things, tools, mod modules, libraries when building a site requires time and a lot of effort. So that's why, you know, that's why it's the idea of lighting. Uh, basically, the idea of lighting is to accelerate this process. Um, it provides a basic site building and the ludic capabilities that are, that are pre-configured. Um, it takes the guesswork out of model selection, uh, allows content editors and publishers to enjoy suit, handy and consistent workflows. And it's designed to be a starting point for developers. Um, it's been said, you know, uh, after researching that a seller is the delivery those are the stats from Acquia, basically uh, from their research, uh, lighting accelerated the delivery, the delivery time of projects that you, that you said, saving basically 30% of development, you know, when it's coming for configuration. Uh, and it helps, you know, helps a lot to relieve the, the developer, you know, burden. So, but uh, let's, you know, let's say that you want to, Build a site with um, basic features. Nearly every site need from one to two, three features. Uh, and lighting a sensing model selection and configuration in four key areas. These four key areas uh, are layout. Um, you know, it provides a handy drag and drop. You know, tools that allows editors to shape their page layouts for different you know occasions. Um, uh, but I gotta say, you know, that the latest Drupal, um, this, the core distributions already have, you know, a really, really cool, you know, layout, um, layout options to, to handle it. But lighting, lighting, it's like a Drupal, you know, um, distribution with vitamins, uh, if, if you wanna say it like that. Also media, uh, for media includes, you know, management feature, the media library, content publishers, can upload images and videos, um, share, you know, URLs, embed, all, all type of media um, from content moderation. It's easy to streamline content workflows between different user roles. Um, from API, 
basically now you know it allows you to share your content you know through um uh through the web services uh you know it's um the core the core distribution already you know allows it but lighting has some top more tools that we're gonna take a look uh, in a bit uh as i was saying you know drag and drop layouts it's a it's a feature that um, basically lighting offers uh, layout builder default um components you know for um, like to embed google maps slideshow media banner text uh default content types and and, and layouts uh, basically it offers a landing page so you, that you don't have to worry about it uh as I was as I was saying, you know, it offers media, better media like support media types, audio files, um, tweets, Instagram posts, videos, images, drag and drop, you know, images in bulk, not only you know one by one. Um, content moderation. Um, it has you know like uh, uh, it it handles default workflow states, workflow scheduling, moderation sidebar, moderation dashboard, revisions, and for landing pages. Those are the things, you know, that are not included in, in, in a Drupal, uh, you know, Drupal standard installation. Um, and the API for content sharing. Um, you can have your API, you know, pre-configured for exposing content to other applications in, in JSON format, but additionally it offer open API documentation, uh, open SSL and out, out that you can later uh, configure. Additionally, lighting capabilities. Um, it has pre-configured settings for descriptive SEO, URLs and metadata. metadata. It handles security. Um, it handles um, developer tools. Like if you wanna use it with Git Composer, Drush or Drupal configuration. Uh, this is included, uh, but let's let's see some of these um, some of these capabilities that are that are on top. I installed uh, today a uh, fresh Drupal lighting uh, distribution on my machine, also standard one. And I start comparing, you know, as as I was mentioning. Uh, for starting the configuration, we want to see something that I really like. It is the web services part when we have, you know, um, the open API. Then if we go to see the um, standard, we have web services, and and here we only have the RSSS publishing and while lighting offers, you know, uh, documentation that is really helpful. So you don't have, I mean, this was already pre-configured. This was already installed. Uh, I didn't have to, to install it. So this is loading, but as I was mentioning, um, it has like really um, cool configuration and, and tools on top. So as you can see here, um, we have the documentation already. It's, it's already pre-configured. I haven't, I haven't, uh literally done you know anything in this clean you know installation um, as you can see here also in the configuration part um this is for the api uh, this is for the web services or a or the api part uh but if we go to media so we have a bunch of also um on top like options like for cropping uh, styles, settings, um, toolkits, something that is not offered in a, a installation. Um, so here we are seeing media and, and the API. And another cool thing is the content. Um, I was playing around with the edit. Um, it has a layout builder that allows me to preview or pre-configure, you know, the, the way I wanna, you know, add content, you know, like maybe I, I wanna uh, build a, a layout. I don't know, I was trying to add a, a hero banner in here, but I can keep, you know, adding blocks. Um, like, 
uh, let me see, or let's add a new section where basically we can make it two columns in this case. Uh, I gotta say that I'm not a designer, but I'm gonna add a section where now we have two columns. So in these two columns, we can keep adding, you know, like uh, other types of, uh, of we can embed content or we can add um, more media. Let me, okay. So uh, I'm gonna use, so those are the type of features. I wanna include the same image that I, that I had before. So, but you have, you know, these, these on top tools that are not included in the standard configuration. Um, to, or I don't know, something like that. So we can crop it, um, place it, then just add the media, add the block, and easily, you know, add it. Uh, this is just an example, something that I'm not allowed to do, you know, even, you know, here, I don't have a landing page content type, you know, for starting. So uh, to say this, this basically allows, you know, to start easily with, um, you know, like maybe as a developers, we can focus, you know, on, on rapidly um, create, you know, the content types uh, uh, or, or structure necessary for publishers and then focus on other, you know, custom, um, custom capabilities, you know, let's say that we maybe need to add a, uh, or create a custom module that is not related with, uh, with, uh, with lighting, you know, it's related, it's related more with a business requirement. So these kind of things, you know, we don't have to worry more, you know, about content part because lighting already uh, solved it for us. So this is the type of comparison. Um, this is the Drupal, you know, also, standard installation clean as i was saying you know uh i gotta mention here the content layout we have a content i mean we have a layout library we can specify our own you know layouts for two columns one columns so that are already pre-built um and then you know make them part of the of the content types uh like landing pages you want to manage display so you can set up, you know, a default layout for this, or, you know, include other layouts uh, or create your own custom, you know, layout, uh, something that we don't have with this. Uh, as I was saying, you know, with all of the guessing models out there, I think that lighting, um, it's like a, a great solution. So great solution that I'll say I recommend it. Uh, and those are the um, ideas or knowledge that I want to share about lighting. So if you want to download lighting so you can go to github.com, uh, Acquia lighting project, and you can discover more about lighting there. So thank you. Any questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Gerson. <laughs> um, thank you. Any, any questions? I don't have a question, but I, I think a comment is um, it could be valuable also um, that package, um, I guess you might, you might call it distribution, um, by looking at the modules. Like if you have an existing seven site, it could be interesting to, to look at that um, to see, you know, what they've already thought through. Like I could see that as, as a way um, somebody using Drupal and building it, um, you know, using core and, and doing their own thing, that they could look at that and say, hey, you know, let me see what this distribution looks like. Let me see what modules are in here. Let me see what content types, you know, let me see what's going on here. And that could be a helpful uh, a way for somebody to develop. So I just thought I'd add that in. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks. So I think the current one looks mm -hmm. like maybe it's Drupal 9. Right. And it's a composer-based project. So I think that's a... I'm sure that's been a topic of previous meetups. Is this something that um, locks me in in any way to Acquia, or can I basically, uh, uh, you know, build something with a local host and then put it on anything? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an open source. You can download it uh, using Composer 
your favorite, you know, um, your favorite toolkit and it's up to you. You wanna host it in Acquia or somewhere else? Uh, what I have read, you know, that somewhere else is kind of tricky, you know, where since uh, these use uh, a profile, lighting is also based as a profile. So it's kind of tricky, but should be, I mean, it's just require a little bit more of work, but that's okay. I mean, you can host it, whatever you want. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dave, did you have a question? All right. Um, fantastic. Uh, last call for questions for Garrison. Okay. Well, thank you again. And uh, we're going to move on to our next presentation now. And I might even share this slide. <laughs> uh, today's second talk is by Scott Wolpow, and it is entitled Open Cart Easy Open Source e Commerce. Over to you, Scott. Okay. Let's see. Okay. It doesn't crash my system. I've just done before. And let's share again. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. And let's see. That's not working the way I want it to work. Um, give me a second to fix this again. Okay. So I have a I started a new business selling enamel pens and I work with a, quite a few of the different um, e-commerce platforms. I went with this very simple, simple products. I, I didn't have attributes to worry about, low maintenance, secure. And of course I, I prefer open source. And one of my mantras is the right tool for the right job. And while Drupal Commerce is a wonderful tool, it's also very complicated. It's a lot of things to maintain and worry about. And it's not really designed if you have a hundred products. And maybe when you get to a thousand products, it starts really showing its strengths. And I don't have a lot of tags or other things to do for my items. So what I looked at, I looked at Drupal Commerce, WooCommerce, for about two tenths of a second OS Commerce. I'd rather have COVID and touch that again. Um, there's Magento, there's Zen, PrestaShop, Wix. There's the, the paid ones, Square Online, Squarespace, Shopify. Big commerce, and then really did what I wanted to do. So I went looked in for a few, and I finally set an open cart. And I found it was pretty simple to set up. It's, it's very stable. They don't make a lot of changes. It doesn't have a lot of functionality. The most of the extensions are like twenty dollars a piece, so it's easy to buy them. And it has an open API, which is mostly about developing for open cart rather than being external connection to to it. But they have that. It's very easy to use and uses our favorite um, framework Twig. So it makes it pretty easy to adapt and get into it. And the pros is it's, <clears throat> it's easy to add new modules. One feature I found really nice is you can actually change the admin login to anything you want. And that's good because if you can't find the door to get in, they can't hack it. Adding products is easy and there's a little marketplace for modules. Um, the cons is adding menu items to the main nav is a pain. You have to go into hard code and change it. The the feature about the having is we can move the admin to everyone. The downside is you actually have two configuration files, which you, you often will forget to go change in both locations if you're moving servers or databases. Um, custom item is a bit of a pain. Some things are unnecessarily coded, so removing them is also a real problematic. I wonder if that was intentional so the people who built this can get some revenue out of it. And um, not every module you control in the same location. That's open cart. So let me actually give you an actual demo of open cart. And let's see. This gives you a little idea of the front end. There's a 
duck in, Mr. Squawk, and so forth. And let me go show you the dashboard. So we're gonna log into the back end. One of the first nice things is actually you see the sum of your business, you know, total orders, total sales, and so forth. And that's the dashboard. And there's another functionality on the dashboard. You click here. This is the equivalent of we have in Drupal, allows you to refresh everything. And just like Drupal and a few other systems, you have to go back in and refresh if you add a new functionality and make some changes. The catalog is pretty good. Categories is easy to use. And if you want to add a new category item, just click here. Type in, uh, go to data to what you want. You can select the, the parent. So if I would say go to furry bones, I can add to it. I can add uh, whatever filters I want. Um, I forgot to do that. Okay. I can do SEO on here. And I can choose different designs. And getting it back is, I also like this feature because I can just cancel with ease. And it goes back. It's one of the nice things to done. Adding products is also very easy. Um, you just go plus to add a new product. And there's a lot of things you can do in here. You can add, you can add some, that's where you add all the information. When I like it, it just comes out of a package with UPC and other data things that you really do need. The tax classes, the prices, and a lot of good functionality just comes out of the box as if it was made just for e-commerce, which it is. Some things don't make sense. They call it links for some reason. That's where you choose wherever the manufacturer and your categories. Uh, it's possible it's, it's a change from whoever developed it so it's an English language. You can have related products. You can sell downloads and virtual. Okay, attributes are a little different. They're not so much the attributes we're used to in most products. Option is more like the attributes. Recurring I like is because you can do sell subscriptions or monthly fees or anything else. Like in my pin business, there'll be a monthly drop. So you can say, all right, every month I want the new pin. Discount, you can sell Vine discounts, which is also good because it's built-in wholesale. So I can have a customer of a wholesale, they'll be part of a customer group and they'll see the pricing. You have the images here. I like this also because you have reward points. So I, I it's just a lot of great features just right out of the box. You don't have to go anywhere else, anything else. SEO, you can put your keywords in. And I'll show you where I handle that in a minute. Reoccurring profiles, you can make different profiles for different subscriptions. Filters is for search. So you can build ones to search on. It's kind of like views. Attributes went over options. Manufacturers, that's what we want to be for. Okay. There's one thing I, I don't understand why this is here. This is in the lower nav. This is in, these are HTML pages or information like about us that goes to the bottom, your, bottom, the bottom menu area, which would be down here. And all this has to be edited. If you want to edit any of this, you actually have to go into to remove things, go into the temple, the um, the twig page to remove it. Um, I don't know why they lock it up so hard, but they do. The extensions, as I told you, there's a marketplace. So I go to the marketplace and load up and I can search for, let's say, import. And you can import all types of things. You can change for free, paid, their filters on that. Okay. Now, just like you can in WordPress, I think some parts of Drupal now, you can actually install, like click on this. You can actually go to download. I can install right from here. I don't have to download anything, click install. I get uninstalled with ease. That's one of the nicest things I've seen. Okay, let's go to the installer. It's like the old fashioned way. 
through your system. And this is extensions, which is kind of confusing at times because it lists all the items here. And that's why you can be confused because if you want to go, go deal with, let's say, PayPal or shopping, shipping systems, they may be here or they may be somewhere else. Like ShipStation it allows you to do shipping through the internet, you know, print out labels. They have their own module. But you can see also there's another shipping section. I'm not sure why they do this, but I mean, if you go through this, it's pretty self-explanatory. Modification, again, it adds things to it. And if you add some modules, you have to go in here, hit refresh, and then enable it. Design allows you to control layouts. It's kind of like layout builder to some extent, except there's no drag and drop, but allows you to almost do like block like type things. So what else do we have there? This nifty in here. So okay, theme editor. Edit the themes. You can go to all the different themes and change the way things look and behave. Um, as I say, uses you learn about if you know about Twig, you can make it make a lot of work. You can make your modules. You can go into the uh, the code and, and change it. It's pretty easy. You have banners, SEO. This I like because you get all your SEO on one page. So in Drupal, we go into the page and do that. I would love in Drupal, there's a module where I can see all my pages and I can go and tweak it, especially if items that are very similar. Like all the same item, one with Sparkle, one without Sparkle. I would love to be able to go in here and tweak all these. And then even if I have an open API, suck all that data into um, another tool I have and go in and make better better items on the keywords. And so that when they click on about us, it'll say about us in the in a search in front of the URLs. Sales are obvious. Marketing, it gives you a built-in system here for couponing, email blasting, and so forth. And a system. This has built-in multi-store capabilities. So you can run three or four different URLs and stores from one installation of OpenCart. And that's great if you, if you have two different, different types of businesses, gives you one place to do everything. You can localize it based on languages, look geographical. You can list all your stores there. So someone can come in and say, I'm looking for this item. What's the local store? Go to the maintenance. You can back up, restore, import data, and so forth. So it's all in all, it's fairly good. It's, it's a little quirky at times. And as I said, modifying it, the look and feel is a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, they, they don't have a lot of good theming. But if you know a little bit about um, HTML and Twig, a little about PHP, you can go a long way. And I mean, I, I like it. It served my purpose, doesn't cost me anything. And there's not a huge support staff out there. It's not a huge community. It's not like Drupal. You know, there are a couple dozen people who are active on a regular basis, maybe a hundred. Other than that, it's fairly good. And as I said, it's the right tool for the right job. I need something really simple because I'm launching my business. I had eight items and I'll have another eight coming in. And maybe a year from now, I'll go from a little more extreme, but it, it does what I need. And that's open cart in about 12 minutes so far. So questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, any questions for Scott about open cart? You said it's using Twig. Is what do you know what is it is it symphony based or what's B is there is there any framework behind it? Um, I can't really decipher that. Other than that, that it uses Twig is about the only thing I can see. It seems like they built his own framework. So such things that if I go to, let's see, go to register. Okay. To telephone is a required item. To remove that required me going to five different um, 
file, scripts to remove it. So I don't know what it is. It kind of looks like uh, the best thing I can describe it, almost like a, a maze of, of a string that ties things together, that whoever built this builds it when he feels like it. Each version is almost completely different. And there's no compatibility up and down to each one and only does what he feels like doing. He doesn't really care because it's not it's something he does as a hobby. So as far as I can tell, it only uses Twig as a template system. I don't think there's a known framework to this, at least that I can find. Yeah, if you look at the repo on GitHub, it's, it's requiring SCS and SCSS library Twig is basically an an AWS SDK or yeah like so no no nothing from no Symfony components at all in its composer JSON. Yeah. Scott. Yes. I, I run into people who might want to use something like this. Is your sense that there is a, a enough of a kind of consultant community that if someone said hey that I'd like to be, I'd like to try it that they if they if they're not that technical they could just you know, go and find someone who would, you know, for a fee, make what they want, because it sounds like something that it, you know. Well, besides my, my company and my, my team, which I'm getting them to work on. Yeah, I mean, you can go on Fiverr and find a bunch of people who know OpenCart. It seems to be more centric and outside the United States. And I, I, I you know, it's, it's up to version three point something. You know, so it's it's the let's see over here. Yeah, it's a three point oh three point three six, and they seem to have minor patches every four or five months. So that I like is it's it's kind of stable because there's not a lot of junk to get in to get. There's not a lot of features that allow people to hack. Right. On the downside is there's not a lot of features that allow you to make changes. But yeah, I, I think if if you want to if you want to use Open Cart. You could find somebody if you want to. I see between five or top towel and one or two others, I'm sure you'll find someone at a reasonable price. I found one guy who's actually built a module and he's doing some custom work for me. Thank you. A anybody else out there? Okay. Well, then on, to the, on to the next talk. Hopefully, I inform somebody out there, and maybe they'll use Open Card. And if, you, if you're using, you have a question, feel free to to, to um to ping me on Slack or email me. Fantastic, thank you, Scott. Okay. And uh, with that, we'll move on to our final talk for today, our third talk. Let's see if my Chrome will work here. There we are, <laughs> Cracking Drupal uh, by Peter. And uh, Peter, over yep. to you. All right. Well, hopefully this won't be super boring because uh, I have given this talk before. Um, this is a little longer, so it, it may take about 45 minutes. Um, so if that's going to be too much for you, scream now. Um, and I will try to jump through it as quickly as I can. Um, so this is, uh, Cracking Drupal was the name of a, a book you guys may remember or may not uh, from quite a while ago. Um, so this is really actually, the talk is more about web application security and I will put it in the Drupal context, but um, it's not really Drupal specific. Um, it's really you know, more to give you some background on web application security. Um, so uh, we're just gonna define security. Uh, then we're gonna go into the main part of the talk, which is really, talking about the 10 most uh, common and important uh, web application vulnerabilities that you should know about if you're a web developer. Uh, then uh, uh, Mishmash has some uh, best practices and advice um, and just a note about the Drupal security team and, I'll, and Neil can I'll always jump in there uh, on that part if he wants to add. Uh, and I've been on the Drupal security team since 2008 and a Drupal core contributor to Drupal 5, 6, 7, 8 and beyond. So hopefully uh, you believe that I know what I'm talking about enough to give this talk. Um, so uh, we're just going to spend one slide on defining security, which um, really the uh, a great definition is called the CIA triad or the AIC triad, if you, because this is not about central intelligence. Um, 
So C is confidentiality, I integrity, and A is availability. And basically, unless you have all three of these elements, your web application is not secure. Uh, so confidentiality, you can think about, right, if people can access your private data, they can access things that are supposed to be behind a login screen, if they can um, access files that are supposed to be uh, private, if they can access, uh, you know, the secrets from your database or the user's passwords, all these things are breaches of confidentiality. Obviously, you're not secure if that happens. Um, integrity, um, if they can uh, do something from modifying the content of your homepage or changing your password or changing some other important data, let's say for your business, uh, then your web application does not have integrity uh, and is not secure. And availability, right? If um, they can DDoS your site um, or delete your data, uh, for example, uh, your site is, your web application is not gonna be available. Um, so those are kind of the three most critical elements. And if someone ever asks you if something is secure, you can kind of fall back and think about those three things and kind of that gives you a good framework for evaluating it. Um, and you know, kind of understanding what's important. Okay, so the main thing I'm gonna talk about is the OWASP top 10. Uh, so OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. This is kind of a open source uh, project of its own. It collects together uh, tools, it collect, does metrics, it does surveys. Um, and so one of its most important um, things that it provides the community is the OWASP top 10. This is the list of the most secure, critical security risks for web applications. Um, it's updated every few years. So this OWASP top 10 is a common, is basically based on things that people are actually seeing uh, happen to the web application. So the hacks that are actually the types of attacks, type of hacks that are being seen out um, among the people that they survey is the basis for updating this. Though there's like a kind of, you know, curation uh, and editing process uh, on, from OWASP itself. So the version I'm talking about is a version from 2017, which I believe is still the most uh, recent version. Uh, you can go here to OWASP top 10 on the website and look at it in much, much greater detail about each point um, than what I'm gonna tell you, but this is uh, the OWASP top 10 right here. Uh, and so uh, just to give you context, uh, the ordering is basically uh, a combination of severity and frequency. Um, and so the things, uh, near the top are either extremely severe um, or maybe uh, quite common. Uh, the things at the bottom uh, might be, let's say, not so severe, uh, but still pretty common or medium severity and pretty rare. You know, so it's it's a mix of things here um, that gives the ordering, but the ordering is kind of the order in which you should pay attention to these. Um, and you should know about them. If you're a web application developer, you should really, uh, you know, have a sense of what all these things mean um, and why it's important to, to avoid them. Okay, so uh, OWASP top 10, number one, injection. This is the absolute worst possible thing that can happen to your web, web application, generally speaking. Uh, this is when the attacker's input is directly interpreted as code, uh, and that could be SQL, so an SQL injection, uh, could be a PHP code, so it could be remote code execution. That's terrible, basically. Uh, can completely compromise your site, uh, likely compromise the underlying servers. Uh, you don't want that to happen to you. It's pretty awful. Um, uh, unfortunately, it has happened at times uh, with Drupal Core. So uh, some of these security advisories uh, may be familiar to you. Um, uh, the last one I'm going to come back to uh, later in the talk. Uh, but these were terrible. If you remember um, the 2014 SQL injection, uh, within literally a matter of hours or automated attacks and Thousands upon thousands of Drupal sites were compromised, um, taken over. Uh, 2018, uh, the uh, attack vector was a little better hidden, not so obvious from the security initial security advisory. But you know, within a matter of weeks, there were widespread automated uh, exploits being applied, really to every single Drupal site that was on the web. Uh, so these are very high attacks. Uh, people's uh, sites were completely compromised and taken offline, or um, you know, backdoored uh, for someone else to use. Okay, so code injection is the worst. Uh, OS top 10 number two, broken authentication. Obviously uh, having authentication broken is really pretty bad also. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different ways that authentication can be broken. Um, so in general, you need to be choosing good passwords and using two-factor administration. Uh, Drupal ha Drupal.org has uh, modules that will implement that for you. Uh, obviously, 
uh, in terms of authentication, right, you need to store your password securely as well. Drupal does this for you. Uh, if you're using another framework, you might have to look under the covers. Um, and authentic authentication also covers session IDs, right? So um, when you log in, you're sending a session in a cookie. If someone could steal that uh, session ID, they can basically immediately be logged in as you on your web application. Um, so uh, just remember to set up uh, HTTPS, basically all websites all the time now should be using HTTPS, um, both for uh, security, but also for um, SEO, as well as for uh, performance, because actually the newest HTTP specs only work over HTTPS. Okay, uh, OF.10 number three, sensitive data exposure. Again, pretty obvious, pretty bad, right? Uh, so if you have sensitive data, such as credit card numbers or health information, uh, that you're storing in the database, um, you better encrypt them um, because you know if someone accesses that database um, uh, external to the web application or gets a database backup, uh, you don't want that to be exposed. But really, uh, with a lot of sensitive data, um, the best thing to do is to do a really hard evaluation about whether you need to store that data at all, right? PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance, uh, those are standards for credit cards and health information are extremely hard and can actually be extremely ex uh, expensive if you get it wrong and, and have a violation. Um, so you, know, you can use a third party service uh, to take credit card numbers where you don't get the credit card. Uh, obviously for health information, uh, you better do a lot of due diligence and uh, make sure you understand what you're storing or why it needs to be stored. Um, so you need to know your risk level um, for sensitive data exposure. Uh, even if you do encrypt your data, um, it's you know totally possible that you're going to you know if you're not careful you could use a weak key or have a poor key management strategy so someone could still compromise uh, the data and decrypt it uh, as I said before you want to use HTTPS for all passwords and of course you know among the most sensitive data your your site has is the user's passwords um, so again you know we I mentioned that the passwords are properly stored by Drupal. Um, other frameworks may not store them uh, as securely. Um, even properly stored passwords though can still be cracked, right? So you really need to worry about exposure, let's say of database backups. Um, it, the hash password, if it's not a strong password, uh, can, readily, can pretty readily be cracked by someone um, just brute forcing it. Okay, so OS top 10 number four, XML external entities or X, XE. Uh, not something uh, we see a lot in the world of Drupal, but it has uh, presented some of it a risk um, uh, through things like the core XML RPC, or at least entity XML entity-based attacks um, have been. Uh, so this is where you basically, in the XML file, um, reference uh, something external, uh, essentially like a URL, um, and certain XML parsers will actually, let's say, follow that URL and pull in the content of that into the XML. Um, so this, you know, kind of sounds like a pretty bad idea. I'm sure we can blame it on Java. Um, it affects things like SOAP, uh, SAML, OPML feeds, uh, you know, any place where XML is parsed. So you should think about if you're doing single sign-on with SAML where you're consuming and parsing XML documents as part of that flow, uh, that could be an avenue for someone to attack your Drupal site or your, your web application. Um, and you know the risk here is that XML parsers may allow these external entities by default. Um, you may have to go and you know set a PHP any, any setting to disable it. Uh, you may have a vendor library that wants to use that for some reason. Um, so consider the source. Um, you know look into the vendor libraries that are doing XML parsing, make sure they're secure in terms of this setting, and consider very carefully you know where the XML is coming from that you're parsing. That is you know a kind of user input and uh, maybe used to attack you. Okay, OWASP 10 number five, broken access control. Uh, again, seems pretty obvious. Um, this shows up quite frequently in Drupal security advisories under the category of access bypass. Uh, happens relatively rarely for Drupal core itself. Um, and, you know, pretty, if you use Drupal core APIs, you're gonna be pretty okay if you use, you know, user permissions and the different node and entity access APIs. Um, but it's pretty easy to write, um, custom code uh, that gets this wrong, um, especially if you're you know, developing in a hurry. So just the most obvious you know, example of broken access control looks something like this in Drupal 7. 
uh, where we allow anyone on the internet to access this. Maybe you wrote this when you're starting to develop and you forgot to fix it. Uh, similarly, for Drupal 8, you could do that too. Um, just set access true as a requirement. Uh, so anyone who hits the site, hits this path, can access it, uh, despite it being basically an administrative page. Um, so obviously, that's easy to fix. You apply a permission uh, or a custom access callback in Drupal 7. Uh, you apply a permission or a, a custom um, uh, requirement uh, in Drupal 8, um, and that's solved. Um, then we have the another pretty common access bypass uh, kind of exploit, which is that um, if you may not think about the fact that someone may want to use, let's say, your module on a site that has a node access module enabled. Um, so if you're doing queries um, and selecting data for, you know, from any kind of node, uh, you need to actually tag that database query with a node access tag. This is something that's not really obvious in the database API. Um, but if you don't do that and someone is using this code together with the node access module, uh, the node access restrictions will just be completely bypassed. Um, and every user will be able to see content, uh, even if it's supposed to be private and not accessible to them in this listing. So if this is assumed like a custom listing page. Uh, the good news is that the entity access uh, entity query system automatically adds this tag under the covers. Uh, so if in your new development, you uh, stick to mostly using entity queries, um, instead of doing direct database queries, uh, you don't have to worry about this uh, access bypass risk. Okay. So uh, we're halfway done, though actually one of these uh, upcoming uh, points I'm going to spend a bunch of time on because it's actually yeah, pretty important in the Drupal context. Um, so OS top 10 number six is security misconfiguration. Um, I don't like this one because it is so damn broad. It could be really anything. Uh, so here's just a few kind of uh, examples uh, of security misconfiguration. Um, so one is PHP error reporting. Um, you want to turn that off if you're using Drupal. Uh, and the reasons for that is that if there are error messages that show to the end user, uh, often they can reveal things like the actual absolute file path of the code files on the server that can help uh, someone who's trying to you know, undertake an attack. Uh, if it shows SQL errors, that can help someone who's trying to develop an SQL injection attack get your site, figure out you know, what they need to do. Um, so uh, best to turn that 100% off. 100 off. Um, uh, if you're still using Drupal 7, uh, the PHP filter module should absolutely be, be disabled and better yet, delete it from the code base before you deploy your site. Um, Another common security misconfiguration, um, and I'll say, Scott, probably this, uh, what I would consider a misconfiguration or security risk uh, is present in that open cart, right? Because you said it itself could add new modules or you know, change, uh, change what PHP code is running. So if that's the case, that means that the web server um, can write or overwrite um, the, X, the PHP files uh, composing the site. And that's the risk because if there's any kind of vulnerability in the web server, um, now an attacker could potentially leverage that to write a, a PHP file that they could then execute um, and take over your site or server. Um, so there's a documentation page on Drupal.org on secure configuration. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I did, by the way, uh, dump the PDF of this into uh, the chat uh, for Zoom and I gave it to JD so he can post it afterwards uh, for the group. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention that when I started, but if you want to have a copy of these slides, um, that's, uh, that's where you can get them. Um, obviously, security misconfiguration also uh, permissions in the Drupal context is a very important uh, piece of configuration that you need to manage. Um, and there are certain permissions that are, are we term sort of site owning permissions. Um, and these ought, should generally be labeled as having a security implications if you look at that permissions page in Drupal. Uh, and the reason they're labeled that way is that there's some avenue through which a user having that permission could basically take over the entire site, either by executing a cross-site scripting attack on other users uh, or by changing configurations or enabling or disabling modules. Um, so things like that, um, basically what, you know, those permissions you have to think basically those, you only want to give those to roles uh, that you trust, or essentially, you know, you define roles and you give those roles uh, with those permissions only to the users you trust the most. And you want to make sure that 
roles that are given to users you trust less um, don't have any of those kind of site owning permissions. Um, so that's a major security misconfiguration and um, you know, something that's not really considered a security vulnerability because you made a mistake in configuring your site if, if you get hacked that way. Um, same for text formats. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about text formats later, but giving someone the full HTML format is basically the same as giving them permission potentially to execute cross-site scripting. Um, so that's, again, a misconfiguration where you've made your site vulnerable. Um, in general, I'd also say, don't use a user one account in your daily work. It has all, all permissions and it, it really inhibits your ability to audit what happened. Uh, so, you know, create individual admin accounts um, in Drupal 8 and give each admin a separate named account. Um, go ahead and block the user one account. And then, yeah, as Scott said, you, it's nice to rename it to something, you know, unguessable. Uh, so people can't try to brute force the password if in, in the case you don't block it. Um, okay, another common security misconfiguration is with private files. Um, and this is uh, surprisingly common and can actually lead to uh, people on the internet being able to download all the private files from a Drupal site if you have such a thing. And that can contain some pretty important and sensitive content. Uh, the way to avoid this is really uh, the way you lay out your entire um, uh, essentially uh, files directories on the server. And what you wanna do is have the private files outside of the document root. Uh, so it's it's totally okay for Drupal to have private files there. Uh, PHP can, re as long as PHP can read those files, uh, Drupal can serve them through index.php to the end user when they're logged in. Uh, but if it's outside the document root, then there's no possibility uh, that the web server will directly serve those files uh, if someone just happened to know the path. Uh, finally, a common uh, security configuration issue is uh, PHP file execution. Um, and so Drupal and a lot of web applications use a front controller. Uh, so basically, there's just one single PHP file that actually needs to be executed by PHP. Um, so if you disallow execution of other PHP files, especially uh, in the files directory where users might be uploading files, uh, you can uh, greatly improve your security posture. Um, you know, so there's ways to do this in Apache and Nginx, basically, uh, the Nginx one, you know, in both of those cases, basically very simply just denies anyone making a uh, request to files ending in .php. Um, so with Apache, you can also, for example, solely turn on the executability of PHP scripts for that one file. Okay, so we've gotten through security misconfiguration. As I said, that covers a lot. Uh, OWASP sub 10 number seven, cross-site scripting is one I uh, wanna focus in on even more uh, because this is really the most common uh, vulnerability historically uh, in Drupal uh, contributed modules. And you know, sometimes even in Drupal core. Um, and what cross-site scripting fundamentally means is that an attacker can in some way inject JavaScript tags into the page in a way that the user looking at the page executes the JavaScript. Um, so obviously there's no point in the attacker executing JavaScript against themselves. What they wanna do is they want to execute JavaScript against you as the administrator. Um, and you know, cross-site scripting, you know, in theory is very easy to avoid, right? You simply, uh, sanitize all the user input uh, or user data before printing it to the HTML page. Um, and, you know, in contrast to some of the things we've done before, uh, cross-site scripting requires the administra administrator to interact or some user who's being attacked to interact with the website, right? So it's not, it's not that, they, that the attacker can just visit your site uh, like with an injection attack um, and gain access. They have to actually like plant the attack in some way um, and then get you to interact with your site. Um, but that's could be easier than you think. I mean, they could send you a bitly link, right? That would conceal the fact that um, this is a malicious URL or they could you know, trick you to going somewhere else and redirecting you to it. So um, this is still a you know, very, very uh, important thing to be aware of. And as I said, because this is the most common uh, attack typically in Drupal, uh, you should really uh, pay the most attention to this if you're a Drupal developer. Um, so the, you know, the easiest way to think about, uh, as I said, you know, cross-site scripting is just JavaScript tags getting printed in the page. And there's essentially two ways that can happen. Um, so the first way that can happen is called reflected cross-site scripting. Um, and that's where PHP uh, directly in the page prints something that's coming uh, from user input, typically the URL uh, or the query string, maybe uh, yeah, basically one of those two things. So here's an example where 
I was looking at the query string, the get parameter, and just printing it in the PHP, in the page in PHP. Um, and so that could be pretty bad. You could try this, and depending on your browser, um, you might get an alert. If you put in the query string, uh, you might have to URL encode uh, the script tags, um, but you know you would see a, a pop-up happen. Um, so this is reflected cross-site scripting, right? So it's reflected because it's uh, it's actually you know depends on the URL you're visiting. Uh, if you you know, just deleted the query string off the page, you visited the page normally, uh, there wouldn't be any attack. Um, the good news is a lot of browsers now um, prevent uh, reflected cross-site scripting automatically. And I'll mention towards the end uh, content security policy, uh, but content security policy can also um, you know, eliminate this. Um, uh, more common in Drupal's history has been uh, persistent or stored cross-site scripting. Um, that's when the JavaScript is stored in the database. Um, and to give you an example that, you know, it's kind of like used to be, you would see this in every other contributed module, literally, um, was the node title. Um, so, you know, this is still a risk in Drupal 7. Uh, let an end user create nodes, no node title. Uh, they decide to put some script tags in there. Uh, then you come along or you already have uh, some custom code that just, you know, pulls a list of content and you want to, you know, print out basically their the titles. Like, what could go wrong, right? I'm printing the title of my nodes in the table. Uh, I'm using a proper, you know, theme uh, theme uh, function through a render array. That that's got to be safe, right? Um, in fact, it's not in Drupal seven. Um, so, in order to make that safe, you would actually have to escape all those node titles uh, explicitly. Uh, theme table doesn't have any escaping. Um, so. This is the kind of thing where, especially in Drupal 7 uh, and before, it was very easy to make a mistake like this, right? Because you wouldn't be thinking about the fact that the node title or some other data that had come from the user was getting passed through, a, let's say, a theme function or otherwise included in the page um, and becoming a cross-site scripting attack. Um, so for background reading uh, on handling text securely, uh, as always, go to drupal.org. Um, here's an, a nice handbook node that had, has data on that. Um, so I want to, you know, kind of pause and emphasize that cross-site scripting is really dangerous. Um, so this is not, uh, I showed you on the first slide about cross-site scripting that attack where it pops up an alert, right? And that's often what people use as a penetration test is something like that. Um, but, uh, the problem is that people see that being used as the test. They might even see that being used as the proof that there's a vulnerability and then they then think that the, the actual vulnerability is just an annoying pop-up, right? That at worst, it's a, an annoyance or a defacement. Um, it's not an actual attack. But however, um, the thing about cross-site scripting is cross-site scripting uh, is JavaScript executing, uh, which means it's basically your browser doing things, which means that uh, it can do anything that you can do in your browser. So if you're logged in, uh, cross-site scripting can change site settings, uh, set passwords for users, create new users, change user roles, enable and disable modules, anything uh, at all that you can do as a logged in administrator uh, can be done through cross-site scripting. So it is extremely dangerous. It is a way, uh, way that you can have your site uh, completely compromised. Um, it is more targeted though, right? This is not kind of a mass, a mass attack against all Drupal sites. Typically, uh, it's going to be more selective. Um, so again, preventing it, we filter on output. Um, a lot of people, you know, who haven't really studied this often have questions and ask, why don't you just you know, strip out all those attacks uh, when the user is saving it? And why, why do you even save it to the database in the first place? Um, so in Drupal, especially uh, the, the golden rule, however, is always that we store the data exactly as the user types it. And a motivation for this is think about if I change uh, a text filter or a text format, right? And so uh, the user typed in some content, they saved it, and now it doesn't render correctly because you didn't allow, let's say, a certain HTML tag that they use. You could just go back and you could now change the text format, and their content would would you know on refresh render correctly. Uh, so that's great, right? So when the user edits a post, all the things would still be there. Uh, they wouldn't have lost it. You wouldn't have stripped out that thing um, that you were initially not rendering it. Rendering it was just the render that was the problem. Um, so this means conversions, you know, standardizations are always performed when the count content is printed. Uh, or output uh, to the end user, not when it's saved to the database. Um, so this is an old slide, um, but just so this kind of is like the Drupal 7 uh, version. 
of kind of a hierarchy of handling strings, right? And going from things that are uh, the absolute most restricted kind of text uh, to the most trusted text. So URLs, there's a specific function to escape those. Um, and those are very limited. It can't be any text at all. Uh, for plain text, there's a check plain function I already mentioned that escapes uh, basically um, arrows. Uh, uh, rich text, we can use in Drupal 7, use check markup with a text format. Um, and if you just have some random HTML, there's a filter XSS function to make sure that there's not script tags in it. And finally, trusted text would be output directly. And this includes, you know, typically text that's passed through the T function in Drupal 7. Uh, that's why uh, that text should be fixed uh, strings and not any kind of user data. Um, and you know, if you have user data there, you have to send it through a placeholder that will go ahead and then typically apply something like check plane to it and escape it. Um, so we have kind of a similar thing in uh, Drupal 8 and, and 9. Um, so we have a, you know, a URL helper which can sanitize URLs, uh, but we do have a nifty new thing in Drupal 8 and later, uh, which is a colon placeholder. So in strings that are passing through T or the equivalent, you know, translatable markup, um, if you use a placeholder starting with a colon, a Drupal knows to specifically sanitize that as a URL and remove dangerous protocols from it. Um, all render elements um, now support these two special keys, mar hash markup and hash plain text. Uh, anything in hash plain text is escaped, just like calling check plain on it. Anything in hash markup is filtered for cross site scripting. Um, and anything, any other text that's you know, printed basically in Twig is automatically escaped. Um, so auto escaping in Drupal 8 means that a lot of this accidental cross site scr scripting vulnerability uh, has gone away. Um, we're seeing that a lot less, I believe. Neil can uh, jump in on that point at the end if he wants to add his perspective, but uh, this has been really great. Uh, basically, actually rendering raw text now uh, goes to a lot of, requires you to go to a bunch of extra work of wrapping it in a markup object, um, which you shouldn't do. Um, uh, <clears throat> the one caveat there though is again, translated text um, is printed basically as as it's written. And that means if you, again, make the mistake of passing user data through something like T, uh, you can get cross-site scripting. So, you know, how do we mitigate the damage of cross-site scripting or mitigate the risk of it? Um, the Drupal core does help us, uh, right? We have uh, a flag on our session cookies. So JavaScript can't actually send your session cookie to someone else to become logged in as you. Um, we require your current password to change your password. Um, though admins can change other users' passwords, so this is only a partial protection. Um, and I mentioned before that full HTML text format, uh, so you should really pay attention to how your text formats are configured and which user roles have access to them. And then again, auto-escaping, Drupal 8 and 9. Auto-escaping really closes the door to a lot of these um, cross-site scripting attacks. I mentioned content security policy earlier. So this is a new, pretty recent standard in the last few years. Uh, Drupal 8 and 9 are compatible with using content security policy, uh, but they don't come with it. Content security policy is a header that you send in the page. And you can send a header that says, basically, there is no inline JavaScript in this page, or do not execute any inline JavaScript in this page. Um, if you apply that inline security policy header uh, to your Drupal site, you basically now told the browser, you basically blocked more or less all cross-site scripting attacks uh, from even being possible. Uh, you can also, um, the one remaining sort of cross-site scripting attack that could happen, right, is if there was a vulnerability that allowed someone to put a script tag in the header of the page and load JavaScript from another site. Uh, so you can actually use content security, pol content security policy also to whitelist uh, which domains uh, JavaScript is allowed to be loaded from. Uh, so if you really apply this uh, in full, you can you know, more or less close the door across the scripting as long as, of course, the browsers uh, correctly respect this header, which is not guaranteed. Um, so you should still rigorously escape all user input. Do not trust the browsers to uh, apply content security policy uh, correctly in all cases um, and, and save you from yourself. Okay, so that was a big diatribe on cross-site scripting. As I said, that historically has been the most common vulnerability in Drupal contributed modules. Um, OWASP subtent number eight, insecure deserialization. 
this is actually a huge problem that uh, multiple languages and frameworks uh, have had. There were huge problems with uh, Python web apps uh, that had insecure deserialization vulnerabilities. Uh, and there's a relatively recent Drupal core security advisory um, that led to potentially led to code injection uh, through uh, insecure deserialization. Uh, and the way that in PHP, this is a problem is that objects in PHP uh, have magic methods, especially the destruct math method, uh, where they go ahead and they do, uh, there's also, for example, a wake up method. Uh, so when it's first uh, deserialized, uh, the code in the wake up method will be called. Uh, so if you have a class uh, that already exists in Drupal somewhere, right, and this could be in any of the libraries, as long as they're you know, referenced by the autoloader. So you know, you happen to pull in a third party library, you don't know what every class is. Um, and in the, the one that I know we, we talked about in terms of the security advisory was the tar archive class, where um, in the destructor, it would delete a file. Um, so you could basically, if you have this deserialization vulnerability, an attacker could basically go around and start deleting files off your server, potentially. Uh, and that would kind of suck, uh, would basically make your, your site unavailable. Um, so um, that vulnerability came about sort of as, uh, you know, uh, some missed uh, corner cases uh, as uh, things that were originally just based on forms uh, in Drupal 7 and earlier were converted to be more of a pure API, kind of the entity API and the REST API um, in Drupal 8. And as a result, some thing, it was possible to send in serialized data for some fields in a REST API called um, and have those deserialized. Um, so end users could end up exploiting this kind of vulnerability. Um, that's obviously fixed now. Um, and for developers, um, in general, you should just stay away from PHP serialized format, uh, especially, well, most importantly, if um, you're using, uh, if you wanna basically send some data to the user and you know get it back from them. So you might be doing that in cookies that might be informed data in hidden um, input elements, um, et cetera. So in cases like that, those are actually, you know, you have to treat them as user data because the user can go in their browser console and they can mess with the content of the cookie uh, or they can use curl to send cookies uh, in the form data. Again, they could, you know, modify the HTML of the page before they post it, or they could use a, a proxy to, you know, uh, modify that data as it goes through. Um, so never ever use PHP serialized format for that kind of data. Instead, use something like JSON, uh, which doesn't have any security risks when it's um, parsed by PHP. Okay, so OS uh, top 10 number nine, and this is uh, basically, you know, half the world has suffered this in recent years, um, uh, including, you know, the big uh, credit uh, reporting agency hack a couple years ago um, was through having components with known vulnerabilities, right? So they had uh, a web application component. There was a security advisory. It sat there for months. They didn't update their components, you know, equivalent of Drupal module uh, and they got hacked and, you know, everyone's uh, information was leaked on the web and sold. Um, and that, that pretty much sucks. Um, so this is in some ways the easiest to avoid. It's also really the hardest because uh, this, is, this is serious work and it's ongoing work, right? You need to update all your server software regularly, uh, monitor security mailing lists. Uh, you should turn on Drupal's update status notifications and emails, you know, keep track of security advisors from Drupal. Um, and you should disable and, and actually better remove from the code base uh, software components like modules that are not being used. So Scott mentioned, right? If you, know, if you can remove it, that makes your site more secure or disable it makes your site more secure uh, as well as probably faster. Um, so a new interesting thing uh, we saw uh, recently was uh, uh, even more fun, which is the uh, injection of upstream components with unknown vulnerabilities. Um, and as more of us use um, package managers to build sites, maybe as part of continuous integration, uh, you need to think about um, the security of those upstream uh, package uh, repositories. Um, and Composer, unfortunately, is not as secure as it could be. Composer uh, uses just HTTPS uh, and does not have any kind of signing mechanism uh, for code that comes to Composer. Uh, so, you know, it's entirely possible that if someone were really out to get you, they could uh, conduct a man in the middle attack uh, if they, you know, had a way to compromise the um, HTTPS connection or uh, basically, you know, uh, man in the middle of it uh, through, let's say, a weak certificate authority. Um, 
and then distribute vulnerable code. Basically, when you think you're building your site with, with good code, they could go ahead and send you along um, a piece of uh, hacked code. And we saw something like this happen um, to a large fractions of the US government and Microsoft and other people, right? This a company, SolarWind, had this product, Orion, uh, and us attackers got in and basically were able to uh, get their build system to put a vulnerable component into this Orion software. Um, and then all the uh, companies using it, you know, went ahead and they were thought they were being diligent. They downloaded the latest update and installed the compromised code. Um, so that's a, you know, that's a big risk. And uh, they, I, not sure the detail, I think some of those may have even been, you know, essentially automated updates where they didn't, you know, exert a lot of control over that update coming in. Uh, and Drupal Core has an auto update initiative. Um, and a lot of people you know, have for years complained why Drupal doesn't automatically update um, and you know, why WordPress and some other frameworks can. Uh, so again, there's a few reasons for that. One is again, that the risk I mentioned before of allowing the web server to write or PHP to write its own code um, basically means you don't have a uh, defense in depth. Um, and again, a risk like this where uh, you know, Drupal the Drupal project is doing a lot of due diligence. I've been somewhat involved in this initiative as has Neil. Um, actually Neil's, and Neil's really the, you know, hands-on person making making it happen behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, put a lot of work into um, implementing code signing uh, so that your Drupal site would know that it got the correct download. Um, but there's no guarantee that, you know, someone, if the Drupal.org site itself was compromised, there might be a period of time before uh, those, you know, keys could be rotated uh, or people could be informed that you would, you know, automatically, Drupal itself, if it had auto updates, uh, could download compromised code and install it when you weren't looking. So this uh, auto update kind of idea has both risks and rewards. You know, the risks uh, are, you know, kind of things I just described. The rewards, of course, are this is a site that's not so important to you. Um, and, it, you know, you're more worried about those kind of automated mass attacks. Uh, you might think it's worth worth it to have your site automatically get the Drupal core security update in the middle of the night and you not have to think about it instead of uh, the relatively smaller risk perhaps of uh, the Drupal uh, upstream code uh, getting compromised. Uh, if you haven't already, you should go in your Drupal admin screen, enable uh, notifications. I would probably toggle it to only security updates um, and you know, uh, probably send, have it send you daily if it's security updates, you do wanna know about them right away. Um, also to think about in terms of, you know, components, uh, that are not going to be, uh, have updates and stay secure. Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 will both be end of life pretty soon. Uh, Drupal 7 was scheduled to be end of life this year. Uh, that has been extended for one year due to the COVID-19 pandemic and, uh, the sense that, uh, the disruption in people's lives and economic, the economic, um, yeah, resources necessary to do these upgrades might not be in place. Um, so there will still, still be, you know, kind of the most critical security vulnerabilities for Drupal 7 uh, avail, you know, will be patched uh, until November 2022. Drupal 8 will be end of life in, Drupal, in November 2021. I do not think that will be extended, uh, but obviously the upgrade path is much easier from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 than from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9. Um, however, it still work, right? You need to be uh, really start now if you haven't already looking at your code base, make sure you're on the latest version of Drupal 8. Uh, and then you need to use some automated tools to make sure you don't have deprecated uh, code being used uh, This in Drupal 8 and will be removed in Drupal 9. Uh, make sure your custom code is fully Drupal 9 compatible. Okay, the last of the OS top 10, uh, one that yeah, we're probably all guilty of from time to time is insufficient logging and monitoring. Um, you know, and this is uh, your ability to answer the question, what is happening to your Drupal site right now? If someone, uh, was trying to hack it right now with unusual web requests, or if someone was logging in from a you know IP address that you'd never seen before in um, let's say you know North Korea, uh, would you know about that, and would you be able to find out about it later? Um, if an attacker got in and deleted all the Drupal logs or deleted the system logs on the server, uh, do you have a centralized copy? Um, recent high-profile hacks like you know the ones on the government. Uh, uh, agencies, the ones uh, are further back on Experian. We're going on, the, yeah, I think the one on Sony. I mean, those, the attackers were in there for literally months, um, you know, rummaging around, uh, installing additional hacks, you know, exfiltrating data, um, you know, because there was not sufficient logging and monitoring 
uh, for those organizations to detect uh, that there was you know, an active attack happening. Um, so really, you don't want that to be you if you can. Um, so unfortunately, that means you basically have to read your logs or use some automated tool to read them and look for abnormalities, uh, maybe to help you search through them, um, look for patterns. Uh, and again, you know, a great strategy, if, especially if you have a site you care at all about, is to have some kind of centralized logging service or destination, uh, so that if you know someone does compromise your site, you actually have uh, what you're pretty sure is a reliable log, so you can see when the compromise happened and maybe how it happened. Okay, so that's the end of the OWASP top 10. Those are all things that basically all of you as web developers should be aware of, be familiar with. Um, you might be wondering about this point, which uh, if you saw a version of this talk from a few years ago would have been included, and but it's no longer on the OWASP top 10 and that's cross-site request forgeries. Um, the reason it dropped out of the OWASP top 10 is it's just not as common anymore. Um, because in part because uh, so, you know, frameworks like Drupal, other web application frameworks have a lot of built-in protections against it. Uh, so, you know, it's just less and less common and people are vulnerable to it. Uh, the basic idea is just that, you know, right operations need to be protected uh, so that someone cannot uh, trick your browser into making a request. Um, easy ways, use the form API, or if you're using um, right operations through just uh, URL, you need a token in the URL, or if you're using a REST request in the headers, and Drupal 8 makes that relatively easy. Again, use the form API for most things. Uh, just because you have a form uh, does not mean it's safe from cross-site request forgeries. A lot of people are under that misapprehension. Um, uh, there's a new attribute on uh, cookies, especially session cookies that provide protection against cross-site request forgery. Um, that's the same site attribute. And that basically prevents things like session cookies uh, getting sent uh, from a third-party site to your site um, the old, good old example of this is if someone put on their site an image tag uh, with, a, with a URL on your site that was vulnerable to cross-site request forgeries. Um, but this attribute now will tell the browser potentially to not send the cookies along with that request, and that mitigates the attack. Um, so, and link to a documentation page there if you want to find out more about that. That used to be a very common Drupal contributed module problem. It's uh, gone now to very close to zero. Uh, and as I said, that's why it's not on the top 10 anymore. Um, so just to take a step back here, um, kind of thinking about you know, how you get a security vulnerability in your custom code or in your Drupal site. Um, you know, the pattern is uh, the problems come when you trust user data. And user data could be in the URL, it could be in the request, it could be in the cookies, it could be in the headers, uh, it could be anywhere that uh, is coming from the user. Uh, it could also be content in the database. Uh, the, content the user typed in and hit save on a node. Um, so you can never ever trust any kind of user data to be safe. Um, uh, these attacks typically use browser features, a lot of them, um, to perform actions, especially cross-site scripting. Uh, there's also open redirects, which is not in the top 10, uh, where let's say a user might get redirected out of your site into another site that looks the same and then prompts them to type their password in again. Um, so, uh, you know, Attackers also use known vulnerabilities that don't, re that don't require user interaction to basically mass attack uh, sites. So every, probably more or less every one of your Drupal sites that's on the web is getting attacked right now uh, with Drupal specific exploits, as well as exploits for WordPress sites, the Joomla and everything else because attackers just didn't even bother. They probably saw it was a, a, a PHP based application and they're gonna attack with every possible PHP based vulnerability that's known in there because it doesn't cost them anything. And if they compromise your site, now they now they have a resource that they could use uh, to launch further attacks, or maybe to steal your, um, you know, credentials, or do whatever they're going to do. Use your server for Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, or for loss, launching DDoS attacks on someone else uh, to blackmail them. All kinds of great things they could do when they compromise your site. So, um, in general, best practices, you know, are things that kind of guide you as to where to start or an invest. Um, but you know, as I mentioned with the you know, insecure components, uh, security is not a checkbox. It's gotta be part of your workflow. It's work, it's ongoing work. It is work that unfortunately never ends. It's, it's gotta be part of basically your re recurring, uh, in your recurring budget of, of development work. Um, you can't just install a Drupal site and walk away and expect that it's gonna stay secure. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Um, and people 
Uh, a lot of people who got hacked, that's that's what they had done. Um, so this on open concept site has a best practices guide. If you want to dig into that uh, best practices uh, checklist, it's a great place to start if you're not familiar uh, with uh, Drupal security. Um, but just to, you know, again, I'll reiterate some of these points. I know I've made them like three times, but I want them to stick. Um, so, you know, kind of just again, thinking about how to make your site secure, uh, think about who you trust and how you're going to audit what has happened. So who has what permissions, who can do what, uh, and then you want to find out later who did it. Uh, you know, principle of least privilege applies to site users, right? Give them only the role they need, give the roles only the permissions that they need. Um, similarly for, uh, you know, the file system, right? They don't give the web server permission to write uh, to uh, the Drupal files or, you know, make the Drupal files owned by a different user, right? So the web server, if you don't expect to be writing those files, don't give it that permission, uh, use this principle of least privilege against fence and depth uh, as best you can. Uh, you know, you want to have more than one um, layer. So if one fails, there's might, might be another, um, you know, or things like having your logs uh, centralized, again, is sort of multi-layered. If someone deleted the co local copy log, you'd have a backup. Uh, and again, as many times as I can say this, software updates, uh, keeping your software up to date, uh, rules out known exploits in Drupal, rules out known exploits in PHP, uh, in the operating system, and in your browser. You have to keep your browser up to date. Like when Chrome says, please update me, uh, you should do that as soon as you can because uh, a browser, if someone exploits your browser and you're logged into your site, they can then exploit your site. Um, so, you know, part of this sort of best practices is being prepared for an attack. If you're prepared, uh, you know, kind of doing some of these things, following best practices, um, if you do get compromised, recovering is going to be much easier. Uh, so make sure your code is in version control. Make sure you have backups, that they happen regularly. Uh, and then you've res tested a restore from backup. Um, it is very sad how many people think they have backups. They've never tested a restore and then they find out when they need it that they don't actually have a working backup. Um, I think I mentioned this before, have a sec separate login account for every administrator of your site. Um, if you're responsible for the server or a virtual private server or VM, um, you know, do you keep it up to date? Do you have a process for that? Um, do you have ways to access your Drupal site, let's say over SSH, um, in case someone got in and changed your password or changed um, user accounts. Um, and do you know where to find all those logs? If it, there was a compromise, um, do you know where to look to see when it started, where it came from? And you know, again, having a centralized is great um, uh, protection. Um, so your hosting also matters. You know, I mentioned keep mentioning keeping your hosting software up to date. But you know what? If if Hosting is not your primary business. Um, maybe you know it would be a good idea to pay someone else to host your site, where it is their primary business, and maybe they've you know implemented a lot more security and have a better process for keeping that server up to date than you would ever have. Um, you know, beware of shared hosting. Often that runs on the web server uh, with a kind of common user. Um, it might be the case that if some other website on that shared hosting is compromised, they could overwrite your Drupal files and compromise your site. Um, so, you know. Generally speaking, if you care about your site, if it's something important, avoid shared hosting uh, and pay someone else who's you know reputable uh, to host the site for you. Um, and as I said, being prepared is going to make it a lot easier to recover if you do get attacked, if you do get compromised. Uh, you want to know what was compromised and when. Um, obviously, you need to back up this the site or maybe completely rebuild it from scratch. Maybe even rebuild the server from scratch. Update all the code. You know, change all the passwords, keys audit your code to figure out where that attack got in. Um, and you know you need to look through the logs uh, for clues. You know Maybe it will tell you uh, which URL was the source of the compromise. And through that, you could find where that vulnerable code is. OK, so that's pretty much it for security. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a few question time for Q&A. Um, you know, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, but I just wanted to mention the Drupal security team, which is an all volunteer organization, you know, part of the Drupal, Drupal project. Uh, you can go and look at the list of current members on uh, security.drupal.org, and there's a handbook page on the security team. And basically, the job of the security team is to coordinate security releases with ma maintainers. Um, so if you think of a security team, it is actually often a, an extremely tedious and boring job because the job is responsible disclosure and coordination. So what we do is people come to 
to security.drupal.org and they file a security issue. And they say, I think I found a vulnerability in this module or in Drupal core. Um, and that creates a private issue. Um, the person who filed it can continue to access it and you know see the updates to it. And anyone can do that who has a Drupal.org account. So any of you on this call can go to security.drupal.org and file a security issue. I mean, don't do it uh, just for fun. Um, and on the module page, if you see there is a link file security issue, that's actually where it takes you. It takes you over to security.drupal.org to file it there. Uh, once uh, someone responsibly discloses it by filing a private issue, security team member will be assigned uh, or several people may get involved and coordinate uh, the release of that with the module maintainers or with the Drupal core maintainers. Um, so what you'll see in there is that the it's important to put in your head that the security team does not find vulnerabilities and the security team often does not fix them. We may vet the fix, but typically the module maintainers or Drupal core maintainers are the ones who fix the vulnerabilities. The security team is playing the role of coordinator. Um, so the security team also defines security policies. And when we put out a security advisory, we decide what risk level to assign it. We are not auditing, auditing contributed modules. Uh, just because it's on Drupal.org does not mean it is secure. If you see that little security badge, what that means is we will agree to handle security reports privately and uh, do responsible disclosure. Um, it's not, it does not mean that we've actually audited the module to make sure that it's safe. Um, and again, you know, keep up with the Drupal security newsletter so you automatically get security advisories and public service announcements sent to your email. Okay, so that's basically the wrap up. Um, if you look at the PDF, you can get links, um, some more links here uh, to good background reading and to the website uh, where you can see about the, uh, you know, some content related to this. Uh, you could order the book still if you wanted to, even though it was based on, I think, Drupal 6. Uh, but, you know, the concepts are still all important uh, things to know. Uh, web security has, has not actually changed that much um, over the years. So with that, uh, I will say thank you. Hopefully that was informative. Um, I will stop sharing and we can do some Q&A. Uh-oh, Michael has joined, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, thank you so much, Peter. Um, yeah, I'm sure we've got some questions here. I mean, I, I've got like five off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll let others go first. <laughs> Well, I actually have a question. As I wrote earlier, I was looking for a module. And I think I found one that tells you which modules on your Drupal installation are not being used. Hmm. The disabled ones we can tell easily. Just go through and find disabled ones. Sure. But how do you find a module that's not being used at all? I I don't think you could do that except, you know, was something in PHP that was going to verify that none of the code in any of those PHP files was loaded or executed. Um, so I would guess probably what it's mostly doing is just checking for things that are actually not actually enabled. Um, I mean, it's possible, I guess, you could look at your, you know, the routes it defines and, you know, look at the logs and see, hey, no one's ever going to any of those routes. Um, that might be a good indication too. Um, uh, if your module implements hooks, um, this module could do something fun and like basically put a wrapper function on every hook and see which hooks get called during the course of use of the site. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I have to look in the code. Uh, so I, I don't think there's a hundred percent guaranteed way to do it, but um, there's definitely, depending on how clever or thorough they've been, they could probably kind of inject themselves into lots of the Drupal processes. Um, and, you know, over time, you know, if you ran the site for a while, kind of give you an indication of, of which modules were, were not actually being called. But, you know, things like hooks, you know, are called every hook of a certain type gets called. So, you know, I, I don't know. Um, that seems like a hard problem. Um, if you let me add, uh... There are some models, you know, like uh, you don't use, you don't need in production, you know, like uh, always only in development or lower environments. You know, some of them can be debuts, you know, it depends, you know, like um, some others, like for the fields, devil, you don't really need them, you know, in, 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 produ in a production environment. 
Yeah, actually, that's a great point, and I think I missed that somewhere. Uh, one of the reasons, yeah, to remove things you're not using anymore is, um, you know, code can have vulnerability that doesn't require the module to be activated, especially if you're using third-party libraries. Um, I don't remember, was it a MailChimp library, something like that, where there was, I think it was test code included in that library, right? And if that path to the test code was web accessible, um, and even if you turned off the module, um, or maybe you weren't even using that library anymore, but if you'd forgotten to remove that library from um, your code base, uh, someone could have come in and basically, you know, exploited a PHP vulnerability and, and hacked your site. So basically, yeah, any code you're not using should be removed. Uh, like the private files directory, the vendor directory uh, should not be in the document root. That's a good argument for building your site with Composer um, uh, and not using like the download.drupal.org. Um, so that's another point I should probably add to one of those slides or remember to say is, yeah, going forward, you should build your sites with the Composer and make sure your vendor directory is not in the doc root. Other questions? JD's claim to have five, so. <laughs> <laughs> I might have been being flippant. I could probably come up with five, but um, <clears throat> yeah, my, uh, my first question is, uh, you know, most developers, most companies don't audit the code of the contributed modules that they enable. Um, so what recommendations do you have for a typical developer, a typical company uh, to minimize their risk when choosing contributed modules uh, to use? Uh, well, I don't know. I always audit it <laughs> before we put it on our, our web application. But, um, you know, I think the fact that they've opted into responsible disclosure uh, that and that they have at least a 1.0 release, right? So let's start there. So if this is something a lot of people aren't clear about, but if a module does not have a 1.0 release or whatever, full number release, if it's still beta, RC, whatever, someone discloses the vulnerability to the Drupal security team, we will politely ask them to post that in public. Um, there will be zero time given for people to you know, develop um, a fix for that. Um, the vulnerability will just go straight out. So first off, you know, make sure you're using as much as possible full releases uh, like that. Um, uh, I would, you know, like the obvious thing, right? Look at how many people are using the module. I mean, Drupal.org does get some report back metrics. Um, it's not perfect, but it gives you some idea. You know, look at the issue queue, look at how responsive it is, look at who the maintainers are. Uh, you know, you know, I think, you know, give it a sense of like, you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, you know, beyond that, you know, I think you, you kind of have to look at the code a little bit and maybe, you know, maybe you don't have to audit it, maybe just look at it. And if it's like, oh, this is really nice code. It's well-documented. They look like they're using the APIs correctly. You know, that, that gives you some confidence, but, you know, unfortunately we don't yet have kind of a better, better metric. I know there was, at points talk about like putting like five star system or something on Drupal.org so people kind of rate or modules. I don't know, Neil, if that's something that's ever coming. No, ratings are like that are tough because like I, mean, I think like uh, you know, restaurant reviews, like the one star ratings are hilarious, but they're from people who like maybe haven't been there. Yeah. Uh, so same thing with modules. Like, that you have in the way you expect, uh, uh, you might give it a one star rating, but it doesn't deserve that uh, if it's doing something else. Right. Yeah. So I think I think the other thing I would think about for modules um, is, and the reason you you need to audit a module a little bit, or at least think about it, right? Is if if you're only using five percent of a module's functionality, you should probably write some custom code or write a custom module. Um, so basically don't don't install a new custom module unless you're pretty sure you're using at least a majority of its functionality. Um, because you know, otherwise you, there's this huge swath of, of essentially unused code um, you know, that you've now introduced to your site that's like a place that there could be security vulnerabilities, but it, it's bringing you zero benefit. It's decreasing the performance of your site and you know and, and give you risk. So, I think that's another thing to think about. People, you know, might be 
often are you know overly afraid of writing a small custom module to accomplish something but like hey you you want for this specific node type you want to automatically generate the node title in this specific way on save you know that's like three lines of code right or five lines of code you could you could just write that you don't have to install you know a, a 5000 line module that's highly configurable just to automatically configure the node title for one, one node type so and uh, I guess following up on that, you know, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities probably make their way in through, uh, you know, non-security releases uh, to modules. Uh, what's your recommendation for cadence and timing of, uh, you know, I guess upgrading modules that are, are not security releases? Um, yeah, that's... Not easy. I mean, generally take them as soon as they're available, but I would look at the change log. Um, you know, and if the change log is like, oh, this is advertised as a point release, but we re rewrote half of it, you know, be wary, right? And maybe don't be in a hurry. Um, it's that's hard, though. I mean, I, yeah, I guess you could, if you, you know, wanted to do a diff between that and the previous version and just see how many lines change, that could also be a way to just get a sense of it was like a massive rewrite or just, you know, a bunch of bug fixes. But I, I think usually the change log is a, a good, a good thing to look at. And, you know, again, this is work like this, uh, is serious, hard developer work to evaluate these things and say, what does that change log mean? Is this update, you know, a risk to take as soon as possible, or should we, you know, hold off two more weeks? Um, and, you know, because this one looks like it, it, it could blow things up and we want to see if that issue cube gets full of loud noisy complaints. Yeah, and in an ideal world, have a have integration testing for your site and the functionality that you built that you care about and run that so you know the things. Yeah, that's a great test point. For yeah, if you have working. behavior based tests, like behat tests, if you have, yeah, you know, or kernel and web tests and it, you know, those things, you know, end up interacting with that contributed code, uh, you can, yeah, you can definitely find at least bugs that would break your site, you know, before the release, you probably won't find the security vulnerabilities that were introduced, but <laughs> at least, at least your site won't be broken. Okay. So yeah, actually, yeah, that could be another many hours of talks about, you know, test, test driven development or about, you know, test testing for, uh, running sites, but that's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, or just have it, you know, have a script, right. You know, there's, 10 things on your site that are really important. Like someone should work with the development copy and make sure they all still work before you get a release. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, but again, it's, it's work. Could I ask you a question about um, the uh, private file system that you talked about? Sure. Um, and you said put it outside the document route. And I wondered if you could say more about that. I'm thinking about Drupal 7 and, you know, when I've set it up, I've just used sites default or, you know, something in the document route, I guess. And, um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. And then in regards to the HTML full format and the cross-site scripting, uh, so say, uh, uh, and, and I totally understand, I was glad to see on that slide um, or whatever your PDF, um, you know, the thing about, you know, make sure your users don't have more privileges than they need to. So I so understand that and so glad to hear it from an expert. Um, but if, because some people, anyway, if somebody, an administrator decides to do that and the user is logged in and so they're authenticated and they have full HTML, obviously what we're saying is that they could be, not know what they're doing in. Right, they could be the attacker right? essentially, yeah. Yeah, what about the uh, file system thing? What, what... So, right, so the, let's distinguish between the public files and the private files, right? Yes. So. You know, typically like every Drupal site more or less has like a, you know, sites default files directory. Mm -hmm. And that is, those are the public files and those those do have to be inside the document route. Mm -hmm. um, right. So the dis distinction is by default, Drupal I think will put the private files under there also and will write an htaccess file, which on plenty of web servers won't do anything uh, like we use Nginx and so that htaccess file would would not prevent anyone on the web from accessing the contents of that private files directory. Um, and, you know, especially if it's located there, like sites default files private or something, uh, I forget what it, the default uh, path is, um, you know. There uh, is no default path in seven. I mean, you define it, you know, you-, you Right, define you define it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is no default path. 
um you could i, I don't know if it'll let anyway yeah yeah but but default path. but right so people often though you know historically put it under somewhere you know under the public files and just protect try to protect it with the web server permissions um but oh, what's okay. better in drupal 7 or drupal 8 you can put it outside completely outside the document route, like the well, same the, way you would put the vendor directory outside the document route. Yeah, yeah, the GUI allows you to, um, you know, designate it. So in the configuration, you can put in the um, location, the path. Yeah. So what you're saying is other people don't use that. They just do something on their own. Is that right? Uh, no, I, no, you still use that. You just, it's just a question of where, what path you configure it to, right? So you configure it, you configure it to some place on your server where the web server uh, doesn't have access to read the files essentially mm. so that you can't directly access uh, the file through the web server um, if so that's that's the trick so like if I'm running nginx and I didn't have protection uh, I didn't have the web server configured correctly to block access to a directory and it was in the document route like a user could be logged in and like oh I see there's a file named you know super secrets that I have access while I'm logged into and I want to um give that to my friend and they let them download it with uh, without them paying or something I don't, i'm just making up a scenario here um right they they could basically then figure out if they could figure out the path actually path on you know uh, on disk under the document route to that file um because i'm using nginx and drupal writes an HTAccess access file and it doesn't help me um then their friend could go and follow that actual path just put it in the in the you know in the browser under the Drupal site that passed that file and it would download. So even though it's nominally a private file, um, because it's still under the document root, uh, nothing prevents people from downloading it except well, web server guess, configuration. Um, yeah, I mean, I know when I've used it, I've just you know double checked it as and and you know I wouldn't be able to access that file. So sure, but you know if you move your site to a different host, you might lose that protection, right? So yeah, again, yeah, the best yeah. practice is to put it. Put it at completely outside the document route. It's it's easy to do, and it then it's it's a sure thing. Yeah, that's that's a good point, though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank Look you. Like great. An excellent presentation. Really great. Thank you. I'm gonna definitely Thanks. be sharing this with people in my organization. Mm -hmm. Dave, did you have a question? I thought I saw you. Yeah, I, it, on our last on our last question, you know, with the point releases or whatever on modules, you know, one of the things yeah. I run into is you've got these modules that are necessary. I mean, arguably necessary and big and you know thousands of installs but maybe they, they may not have had a release in several months and you've got you know you, you end up you know having having to pin to a to a dev release or so you know in composer to a to a dev hash and then you still have pat you know a patch file as long as your leg mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing that you know what's creeping in in there and but i don't i don't necessarily see a way around it you know you're looking at every patch and all that but it, it you know it's still i mean very big patch files at least in my world are not uncommon right now and it, it always makes me nervous so yeah i mean i don't have a great answer for that i guess that you know the one answer is basically if that module is critical to your business like just get involved and you know or at least contact the maintainers and say hey we're using this and we really love it but could you please make a release and I mean, I, I I will admit that I have many contributed modules on Drupal.org that I check the issue queues rarely, right? You know, and but if someone like pings me on Slack and says, "Hey, like, there's these two issues fixed, and you haven't made a release yet," I'm like, "Oh, that's right. That's been a while. I should I should go do that." Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's just a reminder, or often to help, or you know, or it, it it can be helpful for those you know maintainers, right? If you're using a patch from an issue and it's not yet committed, go go to that issue and say, hey, this is working for us in production or whatever, you know, I think I think you should go ahead and accept it. Um, you know, that can be very valuable feedback for maintainers. So I think kind of completing the loop and taking that as an opportunity to contribute back um, would be kind of the, the strategy I would take. And that's kind of that's kind of your your best option, right? Because then then the whole community benefits. Well, yeah, and I'm not shy in that regard, but I mean, yeah. sometimes you just can't juggle it all or, or yeah. there is, you know, some, you know, yeah, but the gripe of the day, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So any other questions? I think I think we're into into our social time here. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We can uh, maybe we'll uh, we'll wrap up and then uh, folks can continue discussion as they like. Okay. All right. 
So thank you very much. I hope that was hearing. helpful. Yeah, as I said, I, I did put the PDF in the chat here and I emailed it to you, JD. I don't know where you usually post those. Yep, yeah, we've got that in the Slack channel here. Okay. And uh, let me just uh, share this end slides here. Okay, so thank you to uh, all of our presenters today. Fantastic talks on all very different topics. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for giving those. Uh, and we've got more talks next month, uh, February 3rd, uh, here on Zoom. Uh, and you can RSVP now uh, at bit.ly slash DNYC0221. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll, we, we always announce our, our meetups um, via our mailing list. So you can find our mailing list um, on our website other places. <laughs> that's, the, that's the first place to hear about these meetups. And next uh, month, uh, we've got three talks scheduled, uh, one about application security, uh, one about accessibility, and uh, one about performance entitled Faster by Default. Um, so definitely RSVP for next month, and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and a final call, that's a, a much younger Ramona, you might have heard screaming in the background. Um, uh, calling for uh, folks uh, who want to speak or organize uh, the meetup. Uh, you can email speak at drupalnyc.org. We would love to have you, uh, especially if you're a first time speaker at uh, Drupal NYC um, or if you don't have previous speaking experience, we will help. Okay, and that's the final slide. So uh, we're going to stop the recording here uh, and folks can continue to, uh, to chat. So thanks very much for coming, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you next month. Everyone enjoy themselves. Don't forget, next month we'll be back to the normal first Wednesday of the month, right, JD? That is right. Yep. Yeah, usually first Wednesday of the month, except when we've got a, a holiday conflict or something else.